Good evening, folks. I am Gerald Polite. I am the husband of the Associate State Director, Dion Polite, who you met earlier. And I just want to say right off the bat, I want to thank the Schomburg and the AARP for giving us, again, another event, another night out, another night to hang out and do what we do. I'm going to moderate this portion of your evening, and what you have here in front of you are two of Sports World's iconic, I can call them iconic, iconic figures. Let me give, give you their props right now. <clears throat> Far left, William Roden, graduate of Morgan State University. He started his writing career at Afro-American Times. 74, he became the associate editor of Ebony Magazine. He then became, in 1983, a sports writer for the New York Times. Among many, many accomplishments in his career, he has won the prestigious Peabody Award for writing the HBO special, The Journey of an African-American Athlete. He is also the author of the controversial book, I'm sure you've all heard of it, $40 million slave, the rise, fall, and redemption of the black athlete. Mm -hmm. Shelly Finkel, native New Yorker. Shelly Finkel started <clears throat> promoting amateur body matches in 1978. He is one of our renowned managers and promoters in boxing history. He has managed the likes of Mike Tyson, Manny Pacquiao, Vander Holyfield, Cornel Whitaker, Meldrick Taylor, Mike McCallum, and Alex Ramos. <laughs> he is the winner, not once but twice, of Boxing Writers Association of America Manager of the Year Award. 1990 and 1993, and in 2010, was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. So, I can call him iconic, without a doubt. Man, I want to start us off with, since this movie was, unlike most other Muhammad Ali movies, was more of a personal side of Muhammad. Uh, so I'm going to start us off on the personal side. I want to, I'm going to ask you both to give me your first impressions of Muhammad Ali. I'll start us off. I was 10 years old, 10, 11 years old, for the first fight with Joe Frazier. My best friend in elementary school was Chucky Bryant. Chucky Bryant was a nephew of Joe Frazier. So when you're 10 years old, I mean, when, you, when you're talking about civil rights and things like that, you know a little bit about it, you're not deep into it. You know, you know Muhammad Ali, he's a boxer, you know all about him. So for me, to root for Joe Frazier was no big deal because my best friend's his nephew, man. You know? <laughs> so right away, I'm, I'm all for Joe Frazier. Well, I'm home, we're, we're listening to the fight on the radio with my father and my two brothers. And I'm rooting Joe Frazier all the way. All the way I'm rooting Joe Frazier. Until Joe knocked Muhammad Ali down. Hmm. And I started to cry. I, I didn't understand it. I was, I was 10 years old. I really didn't understand it. But you'd be surprised how much a 10 year old takes in, you know, subconsciously or into his heart. And I remember going to bed that night, crying myself to sleep, saying, I'll never choose against my Ali again. <laughs> never. And that was my first impression, my first day I fell in love with Muhammad Ali. Um, I don't really have a recollection of Muhammad Ali originally. I followed him from Cassius Clay in the Olympics and his incredible feats and getting dropped early by Sonny Banks, getting up, which wasn't in this, and fighting 
cool. But I looked at two interesting anecdotes, which I'll tell you. One, when he fought Cooper and he got dropped, he was pretty hurt. They don't prove it, but in the corner, somehow, Ali's glove got ripped. And it gave him a couple of minutes, and he came out and won the fight. In the Sonny Liston fight, around the fourth round, Sonny's eye was swelling. They put something on the eye that got on the glove. And it rubbed in Ali's eye, and he turned to, it was Cassius Clay, that was the first fight. And he turned to Angelo, I can't see. And they were able to, you know, wash it out, and he was okay. But I don't know if I'm going too far, but Ali personifies the greatness in humans. And it may be harder for females, and I'm not sure if male, if you didn't fight, you'll totally understand what I'm saying. But here's a man fighting, forget the phrase of fight, George Foreman. At the time, Foreman was annihilating everyone. At that moment, Foreman's goal, and he stated it, he wanted to kill someone in the ring so that the next person he fought would be so afraid of him it would be an easy fight. No one had hurt him. He lifted Fraser off the canvas with a punch, and this is the man that had beaten Ali. Now, you say to yourself, everyone thinks I'm gonna lose, I'm gonna beat him. And I'm willing to take what he hits me with. And I don't know what that is, because until you get hit, believe me, you don't know what it is to be hit. Tyson has a very good saying, no one has a plan to like it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's quoted in many places. And I boxed a little amateur. And I trained every day, and I thought I was invincible. I was sparring. The kid hit me in the body. I thought I died. <laughs> and this, here's a man, and he's a good-looking man, and like his brother said, wealthy. Why am I doing this? Because he could prove he could take it. And he took what Foreman said, and Foreman said it at the end, but that is what happened. Every round, he says, sucker, that's the best you can do. And all of a sudden, Foreman's doubting himself. And meanwhile, he's taking these punches, willing to take them in the ribs, take them on the arms. And until he went in the ring, no one knows how hard he hits, because he wasn't ever sparring with him to know what a monster this guy was. And he took it and drained it out of him, and eventually won. And all the greats, no matter what you do, have that quality, whether it be a lawyer, whether it be an athlete in any sport, whether it be a winner at anything. Here's a man who had everything to lose, and yet he said, I can do it, and he did it. He, he's just amazing. Um, where you start? Uh, <clears throat> here's my first recollection of the thing that's, that uh, sticks with me. Uh, the very first fight with uh, Sonny Liston. And I, you know, grew up in Chicago when I was at this uh, predominantly all, all white Catholic school in a little place in Harvey, Illinois. And you gotta remember how divisive this was because a lot of the old generation black folks, they were, the lineage was Joe Lewis uh, and Sam Liston, you know. And here comes Ali, and it's a social thing too, because Ali, number one, I well, he's Cassius Clay then. But there was ruminations, you know, that he was talking about the black Muslims, and there was, uh, you know, Malcolm X. So a lot of older black people, my father included, were kind of like, you know, a lot of white folks were freaked out, but a lot of black folks were freaked out too, because, you know, they were like, well, I don't know about this guy. He's talking about white people with blue-eyed devils, and all that, rocking the boat, I don't know, you know. You know, like, is it going to be the gangster listed? Or well, Ali, well, maybe the gangster listen, you know, to this guy, you know. So, so my father and I would just, you know, had this lead up to the fight. This is debate. And so I remember, um, that night was on radio. So the night of the fight, you know, I'm like, I'm getting ready for this, you know, this fight. So my father, he puts on his coat and gets ready to go out. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going out to catch Clay. 
Because yeah. <laughs> that was the idea that, that Liston was going to just like punish this guy. And so I thought it was like very funny. So of course, the way the fight turned out, it was just completely stunned. And I remember it was the first time I became aware of talking a lot of shit. <laughs> I started talking trash that night at the house. <laughs> I'm the only black kid that they made two of us. I just came back. You know, everybody was sick. You know, they were talking about, hey, it's going to listen. And I came back. So that was my, my first experience of, of, of what we call parasitic trials. Mm. That I was just so happy, so pleased, but also just because I like, you know, he was a voice, he was a spirit of young people. Yes. You know, and, and not only that, but also of here's a young black man who is proud of being black, right. you know, and it was a really cool thing. So, um, you know, so that was sort of began my, like a love of, of, uh, of Clay and then Ali. I'm glad you went to this to play, because I'm always curious about the second list of play. Show it. There's a lot of, um, stories about it and I don't know the real thing but supposedly Liston was afraid that if he came out and won he would be killed hmm. and as a result of it they say he didn't fight um, I don't believe that he didn't get hit and the thing that is amazing with Ali whether it was his own fears because like they said in the movie, but also when they took his blood pressure before the phrase of fight, it was up like this. Whether it's his own way of dealing with it, but he gets in the head of his opponent, and in this case, listening, he says, oh, this guy's crazy. He is just crazy. And all of a sudden, boy, what's going to happen? And if you're paranoid or if you have superstition, don't fight Ali because he's going to find it and get it and do it. And um, that was the rumors that I heard inside. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I guess uh, just kind of just move it fast forward. We talk about memorable moment. So remember, you know, then he changed. You know, then he changed his name yes. officially, yes. Muhammad Ali. So that created a whole nother thing. You know, Muslims, the black Muslims, and all that, and people were just going nuts, you know, about that. And um, and they didn't know that was just the beginning. You know. So I remember it was uh, Ernie Terrell. There were a number of people, Floyd Patterson didn't do it either. This is how Ali just tortured people yes. who did not call him by his name. Right. And we all thought that was just so great. But the signature moment, um, Ali got like two fights in my life, well maybe three, one more, that didn't count. But so Terrell, and he tortured, we very tortured Patterson. Yeah. And for all the civil rights that he goes black people, you know, like, oh my God, slow it up. You know, he was just like torturing. So then, because he called him class. Yeah, then it was Ernie Terrell. Yeah. So Ernie Terrell, same thing. And that was the what's my name fight. Yeah. Right? And I remember that became the signature on our block from then probably until it was a dog. What's you my name? Beat somebody. <laughs> what's my name? What's my name? You know, and that was like the, the, the Anthem of right. humiliation, right. you know, but it, it was such a, I don't know if white kids were doing it, I kind of doubt it, but that almost became, you know, because we signified, and that took signifying to a whole nother <laughs> level, because a part of signifying is humiliating people, and then like, talking trash, you know, and so that moment with Terrell, and then I guess, as you get older, you know, somebody, well, don't you feel bad about it? Well, no, <laughs> you know, because he was, he was disrespecting him. Though Terrell, Terrell, Terrell would say later on, it was all part of the hype. It was all part of the hype of the fight, but, and, and nobody knows how to hype the fight better than Ali. So he said, oh, you want to hype it? Well, great. What's my name? <laughs> the thing that people may or may not um, realize or understand, there is a certain depth in this person, whether it be Ali, Sugar Ray Leonard, or any of the greats, that can be the nicest people, but there's a certain meanness, there's a certain um, power, strength that they have, that they see when they have to in that ring. Mm. I mean, 
We're talking about when we mentioned a second ago um, Pacquiao, and I'm glad that fight's finally happened. Amen. And a lot of people, you know, say, oh, Floyd doesn't like to get hit. No one likes to get hit. <laughs> and when he did get hit in a couple of his fights, he showed what he had. But if I don't have to get hit, I know I'm going to be here a lot longer. I'll be able to be speaking clearly. <laughs> and no reason to get hit if I don't have to, and if no one wants to pay for that. But it proved he took over some of the mantle of the um, talking, and he's the superstar. Uh, it's, it's interesting that it's finally happened. Mm -hmm. I, I remember, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned I, I worked for Ebony Magazine, and one of the stories I did, two stories on George Foreman, and probably two of the best stories I wrote for Ebony because Foreman, Foreman was a very interesting guy. Oh, yes. He was a very interesting guy. Mm -hmm. And Ali, I was just amazed how, to the extent that Ali had just, I can't curse here, but just him up <laughs> emotionally. Because remember, after Ali beat him in, in um, Zaire, which was maybe one of the top five fights of yeah. all time. So remember after that, George Foreman fought, remember he fought the five people Guys. in one league, in one league. So, so, so I go out to Livermore, California, which is where he's living. And so you walk up over to his place, and he's got this thing that says, beware of dogs. Well, of course, he goes up there, he's got a lion and a tiger. The history of, uh, of boxing comes out, you know, Sonny Liston came out and I was knocking you out really quick. So this guy comes out thinking 12 rounds. He comes out thinking 12 rounds. And he was kind of talking to me, but he was really talking to himself. But Ali had just so completely dazzled him. He was talking about so many different aspects. It was this psychoanalysis. And he said, Justin, so why did you fight the five guys? Because, you know, he said, I thought I was, something was wrong with me. Because he was so sure. If you know anybody from Texas, they think like that anyway. You know, everybody from Texas. <laughs> you know, but he was just convinced. He was so convinced he was, that he was more, more virile, more this. And so th th for Ali to just humiliate him like that, he was going to fight five guys. He said, I thought something was physically wrong with me. I thought I was physically sick. And I think that what happened, because remember after that, Oh, uh, 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 Young. Yeah. Jimmy Young. Jimmy Young. Right. Jimmy Young. That, that pushed him over the edge. But I think something also happened with Ali because remember, Foreman before that played it straight. He played it straight, and, and, and Ali was in prison. After that fight, he realized Ali had, had all figured out. He realized Ali had, he, he knew the game. That he had all figured out. That's when he started becoming Big George and playing to the crowd. And George, the, you know, to grill and he <laughs> realized I was like, damn, I've been taking this shit seriously. Ali has <laughs> right all the time. <laughs> you know? An interesting question, you're 100 percent right. Um, when I had Holyfield, we were in a lawsuit with Foreman, and Foreman and I were pretty close because. In an auction one day, I saw two things and I bid on them and one of them gave them to George. One was his draft license and one was a picture of him when he was 17 or so, sparring with someone listed. And when I gave them to him, he cried and he said, someone stole these from my house and I never thought I'd see him again. Mm. And I gave them to him and I were pretty close. So now, we're in a lawsuit. This is during the grill days with, with Holofield. And um, I said, George, you got your reputation and everything. Why would you want to be in a lawsuit with Holyfield? And part of my language, he says, I'm the same blah, blah, blah that I was then. I just know how to play it better. <laughs> and uh, just what you said. Uh, yeah, it, so, it, was, it was so remarkable. But he was a very, he was a very uh, insightful person. Uh, and then the next story I did with him later in this practice where he had found religion. Remember he went to his old born again Christian thing, which was sort of very interesting. Uh, it's just a very interesting guy, but there is some ethical, uh, there's some kind of honor to this. I'm happy to see it. 
coming back. Well, I don't think in 50 years from now you'll see a history of MMA like you do history with boxing and what it stood for. The other thing, if you think in your own life, if you started out young with a goal, whether you said, I'm in um, 10th grade, 8th grade, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a doctor, I want to be whatever. Most people don't, I didn't. I found my calling later. But if you knew at that age, this is what I want, and my first goal is to win the Chicago Golden Gloves. My next goal is to win the Olympics. And my goal in life is to be the heavyweight champion of the world. And now, you just want it. And then you say, okay, here it is. I'm not going against my beliefs. It's a strength that you can't imagine. And at that time, being young, I didn't understand what he was giving up. I do now. And it's, in, it's unfathomable. You dream, you just say, okay, I don't believe it's right to go over there. I'm giving that dream up now. And here it is. And um, remarkable human, just a remarkable.